Good afternoon, dear colleagues, students, and guests. I am Dr. Niloufar Aminpour, and honorably, I'm going to start the third previous round table. The subject that has been chosen to be discussed today is the future of education in the metaverse era. Now let's uh, introduce our provost, Professor Dr. Kriakos Kvalianas. He had a PhD in European Inter Integration and International Relations awarded by Newcastle University, whereas he also holds an MA in Diplomacy awarded by Lancaster University, United Kingdom, a certificate in Linguistics awarded by Bengal University, United Kingdom, and a BA in English Literature and Linguis sorry, <coughs> in Linguistics awarded by Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece. He has also completed two cycles of postdoctorate research, one on decision and policy making, and one on conflict resolution and critic management. Professor Kaliotis has worked in various research groups. He is an accomplished researcher in a variety of disciplines, and in the last 20 years, he has taught in many universities and educational organizations. He is an expert in developing new curricula, program syllabi, and also in building new global educational networks and partnerships, as he has already done with institutions from the United States, United Kingdom, France, Italy, Switzerland, and Ireland also Singapore, India, and Somalia. Professor Kriakos has published 12 books and dozens of original scientific articles. Professor Kriakos, uh, now the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nilefa. Thank you so much. Dear guests and colleagues, uh, before we embark on what we have to discuss uh, among us today, I want to welcome all of you and also all the people that uh, are watching this in our new campus in Alte Post uh, in the city of Berlin. And I'm very happy that we have our uh, last meeting here. And from now on, this is the setting of what we're going to use for Lord Provost's roundtables. Now, we have decided today to discuss about something that we experience in all our uh, professional lives here, which is nothing else than education. And because the school, our school by definition, and it has in its title the word innovation, so it's innovative. What is the future of education? Most of the people, they say it's in the metaverse era or whatever this metaverse means. Because from the moment that Mark Zuckerberg announced that, um, a huge debate started around the world, how education will move and in which particular areas it's going to be expanded more or, or even changed. And I'm not, don't necessarily talk about reforms, I'm talking about change in methodology and in the practices that we used. Now, uh, I want to introduce my colleagues. Uh, I will start with uh, Mina Sokri. Mina is a lecturer at BSBI and uh, she's also running the Academic Support Center, which is a center that uh, it has been created to support our students to all their academic needs from uh, assisting them in the drafting of the essays or how to use a, a proper referencing system and so on and so forth. Um, welcome, Mina. Then uh, to Dr. Mansouri. So Mariam currently is uh, also the head of uh, the postgraduate studies in, uh, in BSBI. Uh, she is with us for uh, some years. She's doing a brilliant job in coordinating uh, most of our academic activities. And she's also responsible as, as an associate editor for the journals that we have created and also for uh, providing supervision to our doctorate students. Welcome, Mariam. Um, then Dr. Marius Dratsky is our new Dean of the Faculty of Computer Science and Informatics. Um, he came to us with a very uh, heavy, let's say, CV and with excellent experience from public and private institutions. We are uh, very happy that uh, he had joined our faculty. He is in charge of 
uh, an area as it's information technology, but also engineering that we developed only recently, but it already experiences a huge growth. So, Marius, welcome as well, and it's your first Provost Roundtable, so welcome. Then, uh, Dr. Lawrence Ibech, that is also the soul of the master classes and other innovative seminars that the school is offering. And I'm counting, uh, and we're all counting on you, Lawrence, to bring more innovative ideas and help students more to what they are doing because what Lawrence has created in the master classes is the actual needs that students are having in the real world when they go to the, uh, the industry or to seek employment in businesses, which is the real Excel they need or the office or other IT skills, those that the companies really want. So we wanted to supply to our students with this kind of skills directly inside the school. So welcome, uh, Lawrence. Very much. Then um, uh, Zvati Zivan, who is uh, with us uh, also quite some time and uh, she's an expert as she combines both IT but also uh, English courses or foundation courses and, and the skills you have acquired in your uh, educational life so far they found uh, a common denominator here, so that uh, to use them um, in a very productive way. And uh, I think this is your second uh, Provost Roundtable, and uh, we have an excellent experience in the past. And one of the reasons why I wanted you to be here is exactly because you connect the IT with educational practices, and you also had all this multinational experience in BSBI so far. And last but not least, the pillar of, uh, one of the pillars of the academic activities in the school, uh, Mr. William Hazes, who is the director of the exams and assessment office. And he is one of the persons that I, as I usually say, if he leaves, then the system collapses. So. Um, uh, he is the one that, uh, that maintains this excellent uh, system, internal system we are having for exams and assessment. And he is also the one that because of him and his team and their work he has conducted, we have such a high ratio of studies completion in the school. So, thanks for participating William, well done and welcome to your first Provost Roundtable. Now, um, Let's dig in directly into the, into the subject. Uh, I try to create, a, um, let's say, the background, how we can uh, exchange some opinions about the metaverse, the role of education, wh what, is, what, what are the, the new initiatives or innovative practices that we expect in the next couple of years or in the next decades, if you want. Um, we are experiencing things now that uh, some years ago were completely unknown. Uh, even use mobile learning, learn from your, uh, from your phone, or uh, augmented reality, so when you show and you project something then you receive information. But the metaverse, which is a virtual world, uh, it's a world that is using Web 3.0 tools, as they are called, is something completely new. So, there are, of course, other voices that they say, okay, we need to be careful because technology sometimes is dangerous when we feel that it may substitute a human being or maybe in the future we will have something like a robot or a tutor in a chatbot um, teaching the students. We don't know. Let's start. Uh, we'll start with you, Mariam. Um, and let's start with a general question. You, you recently decided, when I say recently, I mean a couple of years ago, to do an MBA, although you already had a PhD, you already had a doctorate. Can you explain to us why? And, 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 sorry, and the reason why I'm asking you is to see, is, is to show to you that education is outside the classic norms that we used to know so far. So, a doctorate can come before an MBA, or vice versa, or it doesn't matter. 
so Mariam, what was the rationale behind your decision? Uh, yes, as you know, the Global MBA uh, offers an international perspective to the students and uh, studying international business will give them the uh, opportunity to face by the global issues and um, hang preparing them for a um, uh, wide range of uh, job opportunity and um, not only uh, thinking that they can work in their home country but also they can go around of, uh, the world and find a job in different country uh, and uh, going to the opportunities in inter international companies like uh, m international uh, management um, with uh, international management or uh, being an international advisor or being a financial manager in different companies. And it, this was the reason that I decided to do an MBA after finishing my PhD to have some experience in uh, international education and then mixing them and having the better future. Okay, thank you. And I come to Marius now. Um, as you are a, an information technology expert, and you, we have heard from, from Mariam about combining practice with education and, and what is really needed. And so, according to your perspective, what is the contribution of information technology to contemporary education and its methodology? Because my personal opinion uh, is that whatever technology offers, and lots of people, they say, okay, it's a helping tool of an instrument of what we're already doing. But for me, what technology did, it created its own methodology. So if we take this into consideration, it's not like, okay, we see a video now faster and we download it in a different mode and then we can upload it somewhere else. It has given us new opportunities to think how to use these technological improvements. What is your opinion? Well, uh, that my first impression is what uh, is that what happened uh, over two years ago. I mean, COVID nineteen pandemic. But first, I want to come back to my previous experience. First uh, experience with Moodle platform or LAMPS platform. Yes, it was something completely new for us. A learning system allowing to asynchronous learning for students. Uh, we implemented it at the University of Szczecin uh, in Poland uh, and the results were very interesting yes? because um, uh, in, in my country, in uh, Polish law, there were a rule that only 40% of classes uh, can be conducted online, maximum, not, maximum, not yes. more. Yes? Uh, now it's changed. Yes? It was very uh, the, the kind of fashion began. I think every, the pandemic every, changed everything, lots everything of things. Uh, was uh, moved to to online learning. Of course, it causes caused a lot of problems too. Yes, uh, and suddenly came pandemic. And what happened? Yes, suddenly universities, schools, even kindergartens stopped. Yes, and we realized that we we don't know what to do. A lot of people they didn't uh, have any any skills in online learning because it was not so popular. Uh, in most schools in Poland, they are still use blackboards and chalk. Yes? So now it's uh, something we can't I imagine. Uh, the whiteboard is something new. I don't talk even the, uh, the multimedia board. Yes? Uh, so uh, we realized that we need some tools and luckily we had them. Yes? We had Moodle, we had LAMS, of course, but we use generally Moodle because the support for Moodle is, is much significantly higher. And for synchronous learning, we use Teams, we use Zoom, we can use WebEx, we can use any other platforms, we have Google Meet, etc. The first problem was to learn lecturers, learn teachers how to use them. The problem was uh, smaller in the universities because we work with students, we are normal people, they are adults. But the problem I, I saw in my ch uh, children's school, yes, because uh, my daughter had, and when the pandemic began, my daughter had not, was nine years old, my son was 11 years old, 
And now uh, my son loves computers, so he didn't have any problems. Yes, but yeah, my obviously you are yes, an IT but, teacher. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but my daughter she doesn't. She she doesn't like computers. Yes, <laughs> if she has to do something, she yeah, will do it, but yes. without any uh, any impression. Yes, uh, so. But my children were in good situation because I'm IT specialist, so I had a lot of hardware, a lot of software. For me, it wasn't a problem. But I realized that the problem was for the people who, who didn't have such conditions. Yes, so, and we started to supporting schools with maintaining the basic equipment, even the cheapest laptops, sometimes second-hand laptops, but only to provide some tools for education. Uh, and to one final question, what would we do without internet and without IT during COVID-19 pandemic? All the education would stop. Yes, we, of course, we paid a price for this period of online sitting at home in front of the computer monitor, yes? We paid the price. Oh, uh, always the quality of face-to-face -face learning is better, especially for even for free young people, for young for pupils, even preschoolers. Yes, but we were managed to provide the education, to continue uh, education. I, I think you, you, you are happy to notice here that in the new building also, the, the equipment, the IT equipment and the new smart boards that we use in the classrooms with are state of the art. I, I wish when I was a student to have something like this uh, from my professors to, to show nearly everything. I think it's as high tech as it can go. And since you mentioned all these difficulties during the, the pandemic, which is something that we faced, I, I'm very proud to to, to say to all of you, of course you know, that uh, when that happened to us, we had already created a, a hybrid online synthetic system, as I call it, and we turned fully online in 12 hours, which was amazing. And for what we achieved, for the students not to lose anything, uh, we are finalists to a prestigious AMBA award on this, which uh, I will go to London next week to, to participate in that ceremony. I hope I will uh, come back with the award. But in any case, it reflects exactly what you mentioned. Uh, and I'm very happy that we are in an educational environment that we don't see these are problems or, as, or even as challenges, but we have innovation in our educational blood, let's say. So we do this anyway uh, as a form of progress. Now, Svati, in relation to this, yes. and as we said before about these technicalities, how Web 3.0 tools, like what is happening in the metaverse, yes. in virtual learning, uh, how this can be applied in education? For example, some universities, like one of our partners, Uninetuno, they had a virtual campus in the Second Life uh, software, which is open source and they even conduct some seminars and lectures there. I, I myself in Second Life have my own private yes, office. Yes. So how Web 3.0 tools can be applied in education? Okay, uh, when we talk about Web 3.0, I think it's very important to know what is Web 1.0 for a general thing. Web 1.0 was just only we were reading the data, whatever it was mentioned on the IT. Where then we moved to the era Web 2.0, where we were reading and writing the content. And we are still on that one because we can write on Facebook, we can write on Instagram, in any form of the data. Now we are moving to the Web 3.0. That means we will read, we will write, and we can own the content. That means we will be the owner of that one. So when it comes to the education, definitely there are two scenarios. One is from the perspective of the teachers and one is pro uh, from the perspective of the students. So if I talk about the teacher's perspective, it will be really helpful because whenever we are speaking as a teacher, we have an image in our mind that even students can listen and they can also create that reality in their mind. But with the help of this metaverse, we can actually show them Imagine that uh, you are uh, uh, telling about uh, something universe and you can actually show the universe to the students and they can really perceive that in mind that how actually does it look like. 
when we talk about our traditional education, when we used to study, yes, of course, we studied in that era where everything was in the books and we are creating with our creativity in our mind how these things look. But in general, now the metaverse will be more helpful and uh, we call it digital twin, means we as a lecturer can create our digital twin and we can use that for teaching the students. This is from the teacher's perspective. And when it comes to the student's perspective, sometimes some of the students cannot relate it with the real life. So if we show them, actually we are showing them, even uh, you're talking about the second life, right? This is really open source and anyone can use that. You can create your own avatar and you can build your own things. That means you will own that one. That is your property. Then even the cryptocurrency will come if I want to use your avatar, I will pay you. So this is how the cryptocurrency will come, then NFTs will come. So this is all related Web 3.0 because Web 2.0 is really facing the problem with the privacy issues, whatever the content that we are creating. So this is how it will be really, really helpful and it will be most decentralized and it will be more like powerful too, to give the actual vision to the students from the perspective of the teachers as well. Very interesting. Uh, I feel a little bit old now. <laughs> um, Lawrence. Yes. As an IT professor, okay, what can you comment on the applications that the metaverse may bring to education? So in a more practical way. Uh, Zvati touched upon this, but practically, how we can apply these metaverse applications? Okay. So I would like to start by saying that when you talk about metaverse, there are two schools of thought. There are those that are optimists and there are those that are pessimists. I belong to the optimists. Yeah, thank God. Yes. In 1926, uh, a researcher, Tesla, you all know about Tesla, Nikos Tesla. Uh, everybody knows about Tesla. Yeah, <laughs> this institution, yes, we yeah, do. Okay. So he made a statement that a time will come where we'll communicate among ourselves with a phone that we keep in our vest and know what believed in. And today is a reality. So I imagine that in the future, first of all, talking from the learner's perspective, the way we learn will change drastically. I imagine that we will learn in such a way that we can actually learn by the way we take capsule. The content of our learning will change the way you take capsule because our patience, our attention span has changed. A research by Microsoft reported that our attention span is now about eight seconds. Now there will be a lot of freedom in learning Students will have a lot of opportunities to immerse themselves in the learning process, exploring things that are hit at all impossible. I also imagine that from my background as an IT expert, I see a situation where we won't have classroom, physical classroom anymore. We will have of course, virtual classroom, where life will be integrated in learning process. Where you wake up from your bedside, you begin to learn. Before I came to BSBI, I had a talk with, um, maybe some of you know about the university, Tomorrow University. And we came into an environment, I mean, this is not the level of metaverse, an application developed by Cosmos, where literally you are taken from one location to another but virtually. So tomorrow learning in the context of metaverse will encourage interdisciplinary teaching and learning. Barriers will be broken. Disciplines that hit at all don't speak to themselves will begin to speak to themselves. I mentioned to my students today why I had a class. I told them that Global MBA that perhaps take three semesters or four semesters will take like one month because everything will change drastically. 
Why do I believe this? 1926, it was said that we will carry phones in our vest, and no one believed it. I think it's going to be a reality. That's true. Uh, yes. And uh, well, tell your students until we bring this to one month, because they are 18 months, to study very hard. Yes. And uh, attend everything properly. Yes. As we the say. Future. Okay, Mina, I will come to you because you were also uh, engaged in foreign language learning and you had all this experience with assessing students in their English skills and so on. Um, how can the metaverse assist? in foreign language learning, according to you? So traditionally speaking, language learning always happens uh, through scenario-based exercises. So we are in our, our own home countries, and then we have like notebooks, there is a scenario we learn, and then we practice to learn the language. Now imagine I, as an English teacher, I'm able to take my students to airport with the help of like Metaverse. And then I, uh, like I bring the context to them. So they learn language through context now. So I take them to a gallery art to see like uh, galleries and the gallery, the art, so we get to talk about it. Or I take them to a movie. You know, all of these uh, can help like students to learn more effectively and more efficiently rather than just like reading notebooks and then uh, maybe in future they get a chance to use the language that they have learned. Yeah, this is my idea. Very interesting, yeah. indeed. Uh, and I think also for foreign language learning to project in front of them real items mm -hmm. or situation or places, it helps a lot. Yeah. Um, now, William, I'm going to ask you something original. <laughs> How the metaverse can assist exams and assessment? Yeah, I think that uh, something that really needs to be thought about when it comes to assessing students uh, is that you perhaps move away from how we currently would assess students and really try to take advantage of the, the additional aspects of assessment that can come from something like the metaverse. So currently we can you know, see a lot of assessment is com competition based, very competition based, whereas what you really want from the students is, is learning and intrinsic motivation to do the work, not because they're going to win or not because they're going to get the highest grades, but because it will, they actually want to learn and it will help them in the future. So when you look at something like the metaverse, when you're talking about assessment, it opens a whole different world, especially when you're talking about the more practical fields, some of which we teach here, health management, tourism, for example. Now, to be able to assess a student directly in an actual environment where they're organizing a proper event attended by, you know, avatars in this case, but to be able to actually assess that kind of, that kind of thing, I think, is really a game changer when it comes to, to education. When you're looking at uh, surgeries, when you're looking at the medical profession, scientists, collaborations in lab-based uh, based work, being able to, to, to basically synthesize what you would have in a real-world situation, it could, I mean, it could open you up to any, any kind of... Thing. Since you mentioned that, uh, some days ago I had a surgery. Okay, and I did that via robotic surgery. So it was a robot, and the surgeon can actually be in another continent. And yep. after one hour, you can go home. And that was amazing. It, it can show uh, what are the things we, we, we can still do using the, the, all the helping tools of technology. And I think we are just even in the beginning. Um, now, Mariam, back to you. Generally speaking, what are the new things that the metaverse is bringing to education? Um, yeah, with the uh, online, uh, online learning rising day by day, and uh, the um, in institution are trying to engage the um, students to communicate in the learning um, outcomes and participation. We are facing by some problems because the um, uh, distance learning will uh, give them the feeling that they are alone and uh, maybe they will not attend to the education and we cannot 
see them, the, their feeling, their background, and these kind of things. But with Metaverse, we can uh, specialize the educational material for each person, depending uh, depends on their feeling, their background, their um, educational background. And then uh, for each special students, we will have um, special uh, programming and will help them to learn more and more. But nowadays we can see that for a group of students, we are delivering the same things. But in the future, we can uh, use the robots to create the uh, different uh, programming and then delivering different uh, model of teaching according to them, uh, their imagination, the things that the students need. And uh, also, in the other hand, uh, maybe uh, we will have a robot that, uh, like authors, create the papers and uh, having a seminars with the robots. And maybe the feelings, they don't have feelings, but uh, they can do the things that the um, authors can uh, do nowadays. I read an article yesterday I don't know if you have seen it, uh, for the first time in world's history that they programmed some robots to give birth to other robots, to create their next versions. And that was unbelievable. Uh, I think it was a project uh, conducted in MIT and in, in, in their official um, Twitter account, they made some announcements. It's amazing if you read it. That's it sounds a little bit scary, but imagine what they managed to do. So, Marius, that brings me to, to the next issue. Is there a link between the metaverse and artificial technology? Uh, how these are connected, if they are, of course. For me, they are connected. But what is the link between them? I think that answering on this question, I will give you all another question. Okay. Could you imagine a lecturer available 24 hours per day, speaking, I don't know, 10, 20 foreign languages, uh, specialist, I don't know, in math, in IT, in, uh, in uh, foreign languages learning? Is it possible for, for normal human well, beings? Well, the like hours us? that I ask all of you to teach were very close. Yes. But, uh, of course, yeah, yes. let's say it's not possible. We, we do our best, of course, yes. <laughs> yes, but of course it's impossible. Yes. For us, it's impossible to work 24 hours per day because we must sleep, we must rest, we must eat, we must drink, yes. Uh, this artificial being doesn't need to sleep, doesn't need to eat. Uh, it, it can speak uh, different languages. Uh, we all know, for instance, Siri, Alexa, uh, Unfortunately, Siri doesn't speak Polish, <laughs> so I must speak English with her. Uh, so there is a connection, and there, there this is a very strong connection. And uh, personally, I can't imagine a metaverse without such connection. That's true. Now that you mentioned this, I'm, uh, I'm proud to remember that my flatmate, when I did my PhD, is the actual the person that created Cortana which is the digital uh, assistant of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And now he lives in, uh, he has a very high position in Microsoft. He lives in near Seattle, I think. But uh, you reminded me. Okay, Zvati. Following to what Marius mentioned, do we have any examples of the application of metaverse in education? Yes, Already? Actually. Yes, actually we have. There is a company like Sandbox AQ. They are working with the medicine, actually. And uh, they have created a virtual reality human being. They can test, I mean the researchers, they can test the drugs on it. It is with the 10,000 computers laptops, they have created a virtual human. With the mathematics calculation, they will give the disease to it. And at the same time, when they are you know, we are using mouse, rabbits for these things. So sometimes, of course, it is not humanity-based and everything. So they come up with this idea. And at the same time, the molecules in our drugs, they are calculating with the mathematics formula, and they are implementing to cure that disease as well Amazing. at the same time. And if I talk about uh, Zoom, yes, uh, that 
problem that we faced that, uh, as the, Dr. Mariam said, that students are not feeling that much they are engaged into that one. Yes, there are some, uh, one of that one, second life, the example. There are also uh, many universities, they started creating their own avatars so that the teachers, they prepare the content and then they can see that one, how does it go? We call it digital twin. Like we cannot teach for 25 by 7. So they are doing that one. I have read that uh, it uh, also helped in psychology. And yes. some private sessions because they are, as you're using an avatar, you feel more free feel, and yes, open actually, to talk. Actually, yes. Uh, and that's why lots of psychologists, they yes. are doing sessions. They are using the same using neural the, networks yes. that we are using to perceive the data in our mind. They are using the same calculations that we perceive in our mind, on, on the, even in the AR, to use the metaverse. So the, even though it is not a new concept, it was already ri uh, written by a novelist in 1997. But that time, dot com came into the limelight. So everyone forgot about it. Then I think this Mark Zuckerberg, they, he highlighted it, but it was already there. So it was actually an IT creation. Yes, actually, it was. And Lawrence, um, since IT brought this face up, okay, what are the next steps that information technology can assist education? Okay. Obviously, a um, lot of technology has been developed. Now, in the future, IT the, uh, education will be focused on problem solving. For example, there will be lots of emphasis on solving humanity problems like the SDGs, focus on solving problems of pandemics, climate change, and the rest of them. And not only that, IT education is going to bring, of course, the, with the introduction of metaverse, then IT education will also use technology to influence the way we teach. There is a publication in 2008 by Apple. It's called uh, ACOT 2, Apple Classroom Tomorrow Today and he emphasizes so much on collaborative learning, problem-solving methodology. I strongly believe that we, because of technology and with the introduction of this new way to teach, that's gonna be the future. So if we bring technology and new way to teach, then IT, IT will be an advantage. The way we teach and bringing problem-solving approach. That I like, I like this. Yes. BSBI classroom tomorrow today. Yes. Okay, we yes. can uh, do something about and that. And I actually like the way we give assignments. That came to my mind. Yeah, good. Yeah. Now, Mina, um, as a lecturer, yeah. and from what you have heard, um, what does the metaverse mean for a lecturer like you? Okay, so, you know, you early, you earlier mentioned that a lot of people are afraid of like being replaced by robots. So the same is with us. I'm so not going not... to replace any of you. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, the, so the same is with us. So as um, Mario said that, okay, uh, what, what if I think that instead of me, there is a robot that can speak like 40 languages and can work like twice as me. So the fear is there, but the thing is, educators can never be replaced. The key is here. So I, as, a, as an educator, I can never be replaced by a robot. Still, you will need me somehow. Not me, me, <laughs> I mean, all the educators. So, <laughs> so we will need educators to like educate the students and to help to clarify the situations, to understand them. And um, also to, you know, uh, the point here is the, this there should be a collaboration, like with metaverse and human beings together. So as also Lauren said, the combination will work if, uh, eventually. Yeah. To be honest, I wouldn't mind if I have a, a robot to <laughs> just, just to work a little bit less. And uh, he can do all the micromanagement 
which I personally hate. But anyway, yeah. so thanks, Mina. William, um, from your perspective, what is your opinion for the digitization of education? Because this is where we go. So, um, I mean, Lawrence was, was mentioning earlier being the great optimist. I'm going to be slightly pessimistic in, in some way about it. I think there's a lot that we really need to, to think about before, before a lot of the implementation of, of these kinds of technologies. I mean, when you look at, we, try, we should try to make sure that it's, it's quality versus quantity, you know? Quantity and access is like a big thing that a lot of people will get really, really involved in. And they'll say, oh, you know, there's all of these different things that we can do. Now, does it really go deep enough um, to foster demonstrative learning goals that we have for students? There's actually very little peer-supported peer research that it, of, of the effects that it actually has on students' learning. So I think it's it's very important that we don't kind of get caught up in all of it and and decide to digitize everything immediately. You know, you look at programs like ExamSoft, which were during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, an exam proctoring service. That had issues with students not being happy. It had issues with certain students, uh, non-white students, especially non-white females, not being recognized by the software. Um, students who had uh, neurodivergence or different uh, uh, disabilities were being flagged for possible plagiarism because of the way they interacted with the software. So I think that, you know, education is supposed to be the big level playing field that everyone can start from a certain point and, and learn that I think that it's very important that we don't, you know, end up pushing it to the point where we maybe have reverse digitization and students push back against these things. I that think can help. all these, um, they are moving to a very thin line. For, for example, mm -hmm. the use of a chatbot, which is probably you have experienced that when you're calling a service, a bank, or it doesn't matter, and you hear all these automated uh, uh, questions and answers, and you need to make some choices. Now, the next stage of this, um, is that this, let's say, artificial intelligence entity is asking you questions uh, to determine your uh, level of uh, education and your learning disabilities, if you have any, or the mode that you can, uh, can learn, or even the speed, or all these qualities. And when, when it does this, at the same time, it creates a customized learning program for you. So this sounds a little bit peculiar or even dangerous or maybe negative, with a negative connotation. But on the other hand, if it's used on a supplementary basis, it's an amazing tool because it shows you exactly what you need. But this can even replace the, the human touch, as, as you said, or all the other qualities. But look what it creates in the time that you save and how much it can help also parents or even schools. So these are areas that we haven't explored yet. And sometimes we are so attached to technology and to innovation and we forget the main roots and principles of education. And these we always, we always need to keep them in front of us. Now, the last question, it will be the same for all of you. And obviously it has to do with the future, today or not today. <laughs> so, Mariam, and all, in general, what do you think will be the future of education in the next five or 10 years? Remember, I think in one of our previous meetings, uh, I told you that most of the professions that a young child is going to do when he or she has the career in the next 20 years, they have not been invented yet. We don't even know them. Um, and, and have this in your mind, because when we say the future of education, the future now in anything is closer than we think. Uh, and the progress, it, not only because of technology, but also in other fields, 
it's much closer to us than we really think. And, and the last thing, and I will let all of you talk, is that when the world is ready for a change, it happens very, very, in a very rapid mode anymore. Um, when uh, in the city of New York, in the beginning of the previous century, they have to change the carriages with horses to automobiles, uh, that change took four or eight years to be complete. That was a record time back then. If you think, we're talking about more than 100 years ago. That was fast. That means when there is a change and we're ready to embrace it, it will happen now in a matter of months. So, Ariane, what do you think will be the future of education? Yes, as you mentioned, the world is uh, increasing rate rapidly and we cannot catch it. And day by day, we can see that uh, everything new is coming and uh, we cannot uh, go ahead by that. And um, the more intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence becomes, the more new will be added to the education. But in the next the, in the near future, we will have a, a robot that can create, um, the, produce uh, articles or uh, pass the knowledge from uh, to the others, but they don't have a feeling. And this is a big fear that all of us had. For example, they can deliver the module, but they don't have a feeling to um, pass to the students and this will help us and all of us uh, know that in the um, classroom when we are teaching them we are changing the feeling uh, and we know each other for a long time and this give us a maybe a safe feeling but in the next future when the robots are doing these things how, what will be happen and this is the this is my feeling uh, my fear about the future you know yeah, I, would, I told you about my own experience with the robot. So far, so good. Okay. Uh, Marius, same to you. What is the future then? Well, we must remember one thing, yes, that artificial intelligence, which is present in our lives, even if we don't realize it, is not for replacing us. It shouldn't be for replacing us. It, it should serve us. It should be to help us. Yes? Uh, the, this artificial lecturer, which I was talking about, has, has no experience, has no feelings. And uh, the expert, the lecturer, the software developer is needed to design this lecturer, to maintain him. And uh, this is, of course, a product with a normal product life cycle. So in this, sometime it will disappear. It, it, this robot will be replaced by, I don't know, by a better robot. Yes, so in our minds, uh, we maybe we, there, there are some cares in our minds, yes? Uh, but first of all, we can't look at the future uh, that we will be replaced by some robot, some artificial intelligence. What does it mean intelligent? Uh, I heard a sentence that the artificial intelligence becomes more intelligent. More intelligent. In my opinion, no. Computer can only two things, compare two numbers and add one. And I always tell to my students, computers are stupid, are completely stupid. But they do the things faster than we. It's so, very interesting so, from, so from it, your perspective so it's our, to hear So this. it's our only imagination. I think the limit is in our minds. Do you know, for example, that the, the power that a typical smartphone has now is actually more than the computer power that uh, the United States used to bring uh, people in the moon. Yes. If you think about that, because this is what happened. Uh, this is amazing. Yes. Now, Lawrence, to you, uh, what is the future of, uh, of education? Well, uh, for my research, I think uh, we should rethink the future education in two ways to rethink what we teach and how we teach. Undoubtedly, in the future, everyone should learn programming. That's the future. 
Yeah, I think coding, even in yes. primary school, yes. is the new yes. alphabet. Yes. I know this. Yes. If, even for us, you see, uh, there was a generation, let's say, older than us, that um, they learned how to send emails yes. and w a word processor when they were 50 or 55. Yes. I'm starting feeling the same because I don't know how to code. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it goes beyond STEM. Even STEM for me now is outdated. So you can call programming the new mathematics, something like this. It needs to start, because this is where we go. It needs to start from a very young age. Yes. Uh, and I think um, it, it's in my plans even to, to bring BSBI some basic coding lessons for all of us. Because we need to know and to be more self-reliant. Uh, so Svati, from uh, your side, what is going to be the future? Okay, even as being an IT lecturer, I always tell my students, we humans created the computer. Computers did not create us. So just keep in your mind, no one will be replaced. <laughs> yes, yes, at the same time, we have to learn the Python or uh, the basic languages so that everyone should know at least the basic of every That's language. That's a very interesting uh, name for a language, uh, Python, which Python. strangles you. <laughs> <laughs> but actually it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> it actually it doesn't. And uh, when it comes to the future of the education, I can see metaverse in a positive way more. Because if I think about my daughter, she's five years old now. She, definitely when she will go to the primary school, she will be sitting at home, creating her own virtual reality and getting under my supervision. So I feel it as being a parent more safer. Uh, now I feel region. even older than uh, your previous <laughs> Sorry. Slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, at the same time, fro uh, from the perspective of learners, uh, definitely their imagination power will be lesser. Because do you know that boredom was an activity? And nowadays we don't get bored. Uh, if you have noticed that one, we always busy with our phones. So that creativity actually lost. So this is the negative one. And with the virtual realities, IVRs and everything, we will have digital fatigue more. So at the same time, we need more psychologists. We will have more psychopath sessions. This is how it will be. But every change come with the problem, and every problem come with the solution. Then again, every solution come with another problem. So this will be a like chain. Interesting. William, what do you think? Um, I think, as, as Lawrence was saying, uh, with, the, with the teaching, like how and what we teach, and when you talked about assessments, I think it's the same. How and what we assess, you know? And what the metaverse can open up for us to assess in people, to really be able to assess effectively how well their skills that they're learning will be able to transfer into the real world. Now, I think that Swati also had a very good point there that, you know, you're talking about digital fatigue. We need to be careful not to put all our eggs in one basket and push this as, as quickly as possible and then have, you know, pushback from, from students with regards to this. So obviously it's going to open a lot of doors and it's going to be an amazing space to learn. Um, but I think that we really need to be careful about how we craft that space in order for it to really promote effective learning. And of course, uh, because we are talking about young people and young generations, who is controlling all this? Yes. Yeah, because the internet, who controls the internet? Yeah. You never know. So, the, we start with the oldest, we finish with the youngest. So, Mina, <laughs> uh, your opinion about the future of education? Artificial intelligence, immersive technologies, and personalized learning these three, they will be like um, trends in education, but all we need to do is to find a way to use them as a supplement to the traditional learning or teaching processes. Okay, thanks very much. Let me say two things. Yeah. First, your positions are secured. Uh, <laughs> and the second is that uh, I think we had a very fruitful uh, uh, discussion and I hope we have the chance to, to repeat it again uh, in a different framework. Maybe we should also create a cafe scientific on, on the role of education because if we don't speak about education, who is going to speak? Um, a big thank you 
for uh, participating to this event today and also to our audience, friends and colleagues. Um, and I hope that I will see all of you in the next Provost Roundtable, which will happen very soon again with a contemporary topic to discuss. Thank you very much.